This session is uh, breaking Samsung's ARM trust zone with Maxime Peterlin. Uh, all right, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks for coming to this presentation about breaking Samsung ARM Trust Zone. Uh, my name is Maxim Petana. I'm working at Quarkslab, which is a French security company. And I've been working on this subject for about a year uh, with two of my colleagues, Alexandre Adamski and Geoffrey Guillemot. So our agenda for the day is the following. Uh, first, I'll talk about the current state of embedded security to give you an idea of uh, where Trust Zone is coming from and why do we need it. Uh, then I'll introduce uh, the actual ARM Trust Zone technology, give you a an idea of what the, the internals, uh, what the internals are. Uh, then I'll focus on Samsung's uh, trust zone implementation, and after that we'll talk about uh, vulnerability research, uh, tool developments, and uh, exploitation. So let's start with the current state of embedded security. So a long time ago, we used to have this traditional architecture with uh, everything uh, inside the kernel. So we had secrets, we had uh, security mitigations, uh, etc. Uh, and they did that because they thought that, well, uh, the kernel is really hard to break into. Uh, so just let, let's put everything in there. But uh, as it has been uh, shown time and time again, uh, the kernel is not unbreakable. And if you're able to compromise it, uh, then you have access to your entire system. So at this point, we can ask ourselves, how do we protect ourselves uh, if the kernel is corrected during the boot process? Well, during the boot process, what we can do is implement mechanisms such as secure boots. Uh, but if we try to protect our system uh, against runtime compromission, well, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. What you could do is to use an hypervisor. Uh, now, instead of having your security in, in, inside your operating system, uh, it's now in the hypervisor. And now you're looking over your uh, virtual machines to make sure that there's no compromission. Um, but the issue is that, that it's still uh, software implemented. Uh, if you have um, a VM escape or uh, an hypervisor compromission, uh, you, it's, you, you, you still have the, the same issue than, as before, uh, and your entire system is compromised. At this point, uh, vendors realize that uh, software is not enough because you can make mistakes when uh, implementing software. And they, they, so they, they realize, they said that uh, maybe we can leverage the hardware to, uh, to enhance the system, uh, the, the security of the system, and uh, act as some kind of safety net. Uh, and this is where trusted execution environments uh, came from. Uh, so with trust trusted execution environments, uh, what's going to happen is instead of having a, a single uh, state in which your CPU is running, you're going to have two. One is the non-secure state, so this is like the regular uh, state where you are uh, uh, regular uh, non-sensitive operations uh, will be performed, and then you're going to have a secure state where uh, all the sensitive operations will be performed. And what's going to happen is that even if you have a compromission in non-secure state, you won't be able to access the secure state because the hardware uh, will prevent it. So we can have a different type of um, implementation uh, of trusted execution environments. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the virtual processor. So uh, this is what is going to be used by our ARM Trust Zone. Uh, in that implementation, you have a, a CPU, and you have your system on chip with all the peripherals, uh, the hardware resources, and uh, you can separate these uh, resources into uh, the two states I was talking about. Then you can also have uh, a non-SOC processor. Uh, this is pretty much what is used by Apple uh, in their second enclave, uh, at least according to their documentation. Uh, and now, instead of having a CPU that can run in two states, you have two CPU, and one dedicated to uh, non-sensitive operation, so in non-secure state, and one uh, running in, uh, in the secure state. And finally, you can have an external coprocessor uh, with the, um, just a regular system and chip uh, that is running in non-secure state, and uh, uh, next to that, you have a secure coprocessor that is going to be dedicated to all the sensitive operations. All right, so now let's talk about uh, the actual ARM Trust Zone technology. So ARM Trust Zone is a system-wide hardware isolation mechanism, uh, meaning that uh, uh, it's going to be based on two, um, um, two layers. So you have your hardware architecture. So this is where all the partitioning is going to take place. Uh, this is where you're going to have uh, your data bus, your control bus, uh, that is going to be separated into uh, non-secure state and secure state. 
And you also have your software architecture, where um, you have the actual software implementation, implementation that you're going to run in uh, SQL State. Uh, so at this point, I've only talked about um, non-SQL state and SQL state. Uh, what you usually uh, uh, will encounter are actually secure and non-secure worlds. And uh, again, so in the secure world, you have over-trusted code, you have over-sensitive operations that are being performed, and in the normal world, uh, this is where uh, you will have, for example, on Samsung's uh, devices, this is where Android is running, uh, you have your normal one that is considered uh, as compromised by design. And this is where all the non-sensitive operations uh, take place. So, to know, uh, so the secure or non-secure state of the CPU is going to be determined by the least significant bit in the secure configuration register. And uh, so this least significant bit is called the NS bit, and uh, it's going to be clear when you're running in second state, and it's uh, going to be set when running in non-second state. Uh, just a quick reminder on the privileges uh, separation that exists on ARM system. So uh, in ARMv7, you have what is called privilege levels, and in ARMv8, you have what is called exception levels. So uh, this is just a naming convention. It's pretty much the same thing. And uh, at, from now on, I'll only talk about exception levels. So um, in ER0, so exception level uh, zero, you have all the applications. Uh, so in the normal world and in the secure world, so just uh, the least privileged exception level. Then you have EL1, this is where the operating system uh, will be. Then EL2, UI provisor, and then EL3. EL3 only exists uh, in the secure world, there's no uh, EL3 in the normal world, and this is where you will find your secure monitor. Uh, I'll talk about the second monitor just after. Uh, one thing I wanted to note uh, here is that, uh, as you can see, there is no um, hypervisor in the, in the second world. This is because at the moment, uh, there, is no, um, there is no way, uh, the ARM does not provide any way to, to do that um, uh, in the second world currently. Uh, and this is uh, an upcoming uh, feature that is coming on um, the uh, 8.4 uh, with the ad addition of secure partitions. But for the moment, uh, what you have uh, is uh, a privileged escalation by design, uh, meaning that if you have code execution in SEL1, uh, you have access to the same resources as EL3. All right, so now, uh, oops. Now we know how we can uh, communicate. Um, we can switch between uh, the two states, or uh, how we know how we can be if we are in normal world or in secure world. Uh, now, how do we do to communicate between these two uh, these two worlds? So to do that, uh, we are going to use the second monitor, and the second monitor uh, is going to run at the highest uh, ARM uh, exception level uh, on an ARM platform. And uh, if you want to exchange data between the normal world and the secure world, uh, you have different mechanisms to do so. Uh, first, we have explicit calls. So these are uh, secure monitor uh, call instruction. Uh, then you have uh, also interruptions, uh, external robots. And if you are in the secure world, uh, and at least in SEL1, you can directly write into uh, the p-state register in RMV8 or the CPSR register in RMV7. Uh, because it, is, uh, it requires uh, uh, certain privilege to do so. All right, so now let's talk about the different uh, software in, uh, implementation that you can find uh, in the secure world. So uh, in the secure world, you can have a full-fledged operating system running, uh, so we have a secure OS that is going to load um, trusted applications, and this is pretty much what's, what you're going to find on Samsung's devices, on Qualcomm's devices, um, then you can have a, a lighter solution, uh, pretty much completely the, the, the opposite, uh, where you have a, a synchronous library, which is going to be used by the normal world as some kind of secure uh, API. Uh, and you can run uh, cri cryptographic uh, operations, uh, and you have all your secret keys uh, that are stored in the secure world, and the normal world cannot access them. And this is a way that you can do a cryptography in a secure manner. And an example of uh, such an implementation will be uh, the Nintendo Switch. And finally, uh, the, the ARM documentation talks about intermediate options. Uh, we have never seen uh, something like, uh, like this um, in practice, but in theory, because uh, the Trust Zone technology is so flexible, you can do pretty much anything you want. Uh, but uh, to our knowledge, it's not used uh, that much. 
All right, so what is uh, Trust Zone actually used for? Well, uh, most of the time, Trust Zone will be uh, used to access hardware-backed uh, features. Uh, for example, the cryptographic engine, uh, credential storage, the TRNG, etc. And uh, using these hardware-backed features, you can uh, start to uh, create more advanced um, uh, systems, such as uh, DRMs, and you can also do things such as protecting and monitoring the normal world uh, by using the secure world. And an example of that would be uh, Samsung's RKP uh, for real-time kernel protection and uh, Samsung's PKM, uh, PKM for periodic kernel measurements. All right, so uh, now I've talked about uh, the, the, uh, the ARMS Trust Zone, uh, explain a little bit how it works. And uh, now let's see how they, uh, the implementation that has been uh, done by Samsung. So uh, Samsung devices are a bit um, particular because uh, they can either have a system on chip that is made by Samsung, so this is the, the Exynos uh, SOX, and then they can also use Qualcomm's uh, Snapdragon. The, the reason for that is that uh, depending on the country, uh, because of telecommunication norms, because of patent issues, uh, you will have uh, either the, an Exynos or a Snapdragon. Uh, the thing that is uh, important here is to, is to, no to note is that uh, Samsung's trust zone is only found on Exynos uh, socks. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be uh, Qualcomm's trust zone. And uh, this trust zone was first used on uh, the Samsung Galaxy S3, and uh, the trusted OS that, uh, that are used, there are two different trusted OS. Uh, the first one is uh, Kinibi, that is developed by Trustonic, and uh, you can find this uh, trusted OS from the Galaxy S3 to the Galaxy S9. And uh, now they are starting to replace Kinibi by their own implementation, which is called Tigris, and you can find this one on the Galaxy S10. And uh, so I'm only talking about Galaxy models here, but uh, these uh, two um, trusted OS are used on other phones uh, and other models too. Uh, and this talk will uh, focus exclusively on Kinibi. All right, so this presentation is not the first uh, publication on the subject. There has already been uh, research done uh, on the subject before. So uh, here I've noted uh, three notable uh, examples. Um, the first one is reverse engineering Samsung S6 S boot by Fernand and Song. Uh, in this article, he explains how uh, the ARM trusted firmware, uh, the secure monitor implementation that is used by Samsung, uh, works. And he also explains how you can extract the trusted OS from an OTA. Then you have Unbox Your Phone by Daniel Komaromi, uh, where he reverse engineered a, a really big part of, the, of Kinibi and uh, the different components. A lot of uh, our work is based on what he has done. Uh, and uh, in uh, his article series, he also explained how he exploited vulnerabilities uh, in some trustlets. And finally, there is Trust Issues Exploiting Trust Zone T's by Gal Daniamini. And uh, in, this, uh, in this article, he has done a security analysis of different trusted execution environments. And uh, one of the really important results that he has found is that uh, there was no revocation uh, in uh, Samsung's trust zone. And what that means is that if you have a trusted application that is vulnerable, um, you are still able to load it on uh, the newest versions of the, of the trusted OS, which should not happen because uh, if you have a vulnerability, you patched it, you shouldn't be able to load uh, all the trustlets uh, in the newer trust zone. And uh, now Kinibi has implemented uh, a feature uh, that uh, manages just that. Uh, but the issue uh, is that at the moment, uh, there are some trustlets that do not use that feature, meaning that uh, even on the Galaxy S9, you still have revocation problems. Uh, and if you have a vulnerability in a trustlet from, uh, I don't know, six months ago, you're still ab able to exploit it in upstream versions. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, the, the architecture of Samsung's trust zone. So in the normal world, you will have different components. So you have drivers, diamonds, libraries, interfaces that are going to be used by the normal world to communicate with the secure world. Um, the communications are going to pass through uh, the SMCs. And uh, since SMCs are, cannot, um, they, they cannot uh, pass a lot of, inform uh, of information, what's going to happen is that we're going to use the SMCs to set up um, a shared memory buffer. And the, the most of the data will uh, be transferred using this um, shared memory buffer. Then uh, you have the secure monitor uh, implementation. So as I said, they are using ARM trusted firmware, which is an open source reference provided by ARM. 
And uh, the, what is interesting uh, with uh, this implementation is that, yeah, yeah, first it's open source, so there are chances that it has been heavily reviewed, uh, and it's pretty safe to use it, and also that it's really modular, um, meaning that um, any vendor can take this implementation and adapt it to their, uh, to their own needs. And finally, now I'm going to concentrate on the uh, SEL0 and SEL1 components. Uh, the, and I'm going to call that the trusted OS. And the trusted OS uh, is based on a microkernel uh, architecture. So the trusted OS is KDB. Uh, it's a 32-bit OS that is developed by Trustnik. And uh, the actual microkernel is called MTK. And it's the only component that is going to run in SEL1. All the other components are running in SEL0, which limits uh, a lot the attack surface that you, that you have on, on KDB. Um, but uh, lesser privileged uh, processes still need to execute some, uh, some privileged uh, operation. And to do that, uh, MTK provides uh, syscall. So with syscall, you can do things such as memory mapping, uh, process creation, SMCs, but these SVCs are not available to all type of, uh, of, of processes. It depends of, on, their, uh, on their privileges, because they have software-defined uh, privileges in SCL0. Uh, one of the other things uh, KineB is responsible for is to build other uh, components, and especially RTM. RTM is the runtime manager. Uh, this is also a component that is running SCL0, and uh, this is like a, a special type of, of trusted application, and it's equivalent to the, to the init process on Linux. Its main task is going to uh, be to start and manage other processes, but also to manage the, oops, to manage the, the communication between uh, the, uh, the trusted applications uh, and the normal world, and also to manage um, the communications between the, uh, all the processes running in uh, SCL0. And to do that, so you, so you have IPCs and also uh, the MobiCore, the MobiCore com communication interface to communicate with the normal world. Uh, then we have uh, the MCLib. So this is KineB's standard library. Uh, it's going to provide standard function for trusted applications, secret drivers, and also uh, RTM. It's separated into two sets of APIs. You have the, the APIs for the trusted application, which is called uh, the TL APIs. And then you have the functions for uh, used by secret drivers, which are called the DR APIs. And uh, this library is especially useful uh, when we're doing exploitation, because this is where we're going to find most of our gadgets. All right, so at this point, I've talked a lot about trusted applications, but I didn't give uh, an actual definition uh, of it. So trusted applications are like the equivalent of regular applications that you find in the normal world. Uh, and we're going to run in SCL0. And uh, since you have uh, since your operating system running the trusted OS has limited functionalities, um, what is going to happen is that uh, you have your trusted applications that are used as an extension of the trusted OS, so that uh, you're able to um, implement more functionalities such as trusted UI, DRM, uh, secret storage, etc. And these binaries, uh, so they are executables, uh, they are going to be loaded directly from the normal world uh, and. To, to make sure that uh, you cannot just load any uh, executable, uh, they are signed by uh, Trustonic. So the life cycle of trusted applications. Uh, when you're going to load a trusted application from the normal world, uh, you will, so you use the API in the normal world, uh, you send your application in the secure world, um, the, sec the trusted OS, uh, I mean RTM is going to check the signature to make sure that it's, uh, that it's okay. Then uh, it's going to uh, make different checks uh, and initialization, such as stack initialization. And uh, one thing to note also is that uh, the communication between uh, the normal world and the trustlets will be mostly made using uh, the world share memory buffer. And in Kinemi's uh, terminolo uh, in Trustonic terminology, uh, this world share memory buffer is called a TCI buffer. And this TCI buffer is going to, uh, to contain data. Uh, so what's going to happen is that in a normal world, you're going to put data in your uh, TCI buffer. You send a notification to the trustlet that data uh, are waiting to be processed. The trustlet is, has entered uh, an infinite loop where it's going to wait for this notification. Then it's going to look at the data that is in the TCI buffer. Uh, depending on the, uh, the data that you have sent, it's going to execute a certain type of command. And uh, once this command has, uh, has, been, uh, has been performed, 
of, uh, of a trusted application write back the results into the TCI buffer, and it's going to notify the normal world that uh, the command has been handled, and the normal world can now retrieve the results from the TCI buffer. Uh, also, secure drivers. Uh, so, secure drivers are a special type of trusted applications. Um, they also run at SCL0, but they have more privileges than, uh, uh, than trustnets because they have access to a richer set of APIs, they have access to more SVCs, and uh, they're they use, they also used by trustnets um, as an interface to access uh, physical memory and uh, also um, secure resources. So, um, and to do that, uh, because we don't want Trusted to, to be able to do anything, even though we are running in the Trusted world, they, um, they uh, even though we are running in the Trusted world, they are not uh, completely trusted, uh, and they cannot do anything they want. And the, uh, the secure drivers are acting as some kind of uh, secure uh, buffer between uh, the secure uh, the, the other resources and uh, the Trusted application. And so, uh, in order to, uh, to communicate with the secure driver, the trustlet will use uh, IPCs and send data uh, using that. All right, so this was the, uh, uh, a, a big overview of what uh, the Samsung's trust zone is and how it works. So now let's see how uh, we are going to find vulnerabilities on this uh, platform. So uh, first, we needed to assess this, the attack surface on, uh, on this target. So uh, we are in the normal world, and uh, we want to have a privilege uh, of code execution in SCL1 or EL3. What we can do uh, is that we start by attacking a trusted application, then we attack a driver, a secret driver, and from there we have access to enough Cisco uh, to have a large attack sur surface on, on the trusted OS, on KDB. And here uh, we could, oops, and uh, here we could uh, find vulnerabilities in the in the SVCs and uh, try to gain um, code execution in SCL1. What we can also do, because secret drivers are able to do SMCs, uh, we could also attack the monitor from, uh, from SCL0. Uh, this is also possible from uh, the normal world, but the issue is that the attack surface is really small compared to the one that you have from uh, the secret world. And uh, also another issue is that uh, because ATF is open source, there are chances that it has been uh, heavily reviewed, and so the um, it seemed kind of hard to find vulnerability in that. So we, uh, we prefer to um, concentrate on trusted applications because they uh, look like low hanging fruits. So now I'm going to explain our journey in uh, five steps. So uh, the first one, the first one uh, is, so now we want to attack, uh, we want to find vulnerabilities in trusted application. So the first thing we need to do is to load them into uh, a disassembler. So trusted applications are based on the MCLA format. It's the same thing for secret drivers and RTM. And this is a proprietary file format that is uh, quite simple. And uh, there was already an idle loader for that format. And uh, we have also developed one uh, for Ghidra. So uh, these two uh, loaders are available online uh, if you need them. Uh, the next step was to identify uh, functions in the, um, in the trustlets. Uh, because in the trustlets, you will have call to the mclib. And in the mclib, uh, you have different functions that are uh, reused in, uh, in trustlets. And having access to this information uh, is really useful because you get a general idea of what the trustlet is used for. And here we have an example um, of uh, our script in, uh, in execution. Uh, in, uh, on the left, uh, we have no symbol. Uh, it's pretty complicated to, to understand what's going on. But uh, afterwards, uh, after our script uh, has been executed, we are able to have the name of the function and also its prototype. Uh, okay, so at this point, we are able to do a static analysis. Uh, but when we were, what we wanted to have are dynamic capabilities. But since we have not access to the SDK of Trustonic, uh, we needed to find uh, uh, another uh, solution. So what we did is that we developed an emulator to uh, emulate the trustlets. So it's a simple emulator that is based on Unicorn and it's going to load the MCLS binary, it's going to map the shared memory buffer, and it's going to hook uh, the, uh, the MCLS functions and also implement some of them so that uh, the execution, the trustlet execution, executes almost completely. So here's an example of the emulator uh, running. So the first thing I'm doing here is to create uh, an input uh, of the TCI buffer. So I'm putting this one in input.bin. 
And then I'm passing uh, this uh, input bin to our emulator. And now the emulator is going to execute. And uh, here we can see that the binary has been loaded. Uh, we have the different sections that have been mapped. And here we have, uh, the, for example, the TL API log B printf function that has been hooked. And we can see the output uh, right here. So the emulator is uh, really useful during reverse engineering, but also during uh, exploitation, because we were able to test our exploits on this emulator. So now uh, we are able to find, uh, so we have all the capabilities that we wanted. Uh, we are able to find vulnerabilities uh, statically, but we also wanted to find them uh, dynamically uh, using a FUDZ. So uh, this FUDZ is based on our pre previous emulator. Uh, it's, it's, if you're familiar with AFL Unicorn, uh, we have an internal version of that that is uh, equivalent, but uh, the, performance, the performances are a little bit better. And uh, we have used that um, to uh, so we have plugged this uh, AFL, further, uh, AFL unicorn like uh, project uh, into our emulator, and we are able to uh, FUD trustlets uh, using that. So here's an example. Uh, here I'm running the trustlets. Uh, I'm running the FUDs on the trustlets, and uh, you can see that after only uh, 12 seconds, we have already three unique crashes. So uh, this is pretty useful. We have found a lot of vulnerabilities using that. Um, another way to find vulnerabilities that we have implemented uh, is to use symbolic execution. And we have used uh, Manticore by Trail of Bits. So um, the strategy that we have used is pretty simple. Uh, we are using, uh, so we are, mark we are taking the TCI buffer, we are marking it as uh, symbolic. Then we explore the different paths of the trust set, so the different command handler, etc. Then we check the reads and writes uh, to memory, and we uh, look in we try to detect if there is an invalid uh, address that has been accessed. Uh, so here's an example right here. Uh, I'm running the, the um, Manticore on the trustlet. And uh, here you have a crash result. Um, and right here you have uh, R1 that is going to be dereferenced. And if you look at the value of R1, uh, this is a user control value. So this is a value that is directly taken from uh, the TCA buffer. And uh, this is not a vulnerability per se. Uh, we don't, uh, because we still have to look at the rest of the code to make sure that it's actually exploitable, but this is a good starting point. And finally, now that we have all the vulnerabilities that we want, uh, we wanted to exploit the vulnerabilities. And to do that, uh, well, you have to uh, use the native library of native API that are available uh, in the normal world to communicate with the secure world. Uh, the issue with that is that uh, we need to write our exploit in C. And we didn't want to do that uh, because we prefer Python. And so we have developed Python binding for the API in, uh, found in the second world. And uh, so we have the, the API that is called MC Client. Uh, our bindings are called PyMan MC Client. And it provides uh, different utilities, just XDOM, disassemble, assemble, uh, and also a common interpreter. But the most uh, interesting uh, feature is uh, not actually a feature, but uh, the result is that the scripts that we are using are really simple. Uh, so here is a script example that is going to load a trustlet, uh, send a command to it, wait for the notification, and display the result. And it's not even 20 lines of Python, and the equivalent in C would be about 100 lines. All right, so these are the different tools that we have developed. Uh, now let's see, uh, let's take a look at three uh, vulnerabilities that we have found and how we have exploited them. So the target here is going to be a Samsung Galaxy S7, S7 that is running Android 7. So this is pretty old, uh, but all the tools, all the methodology, uh, everything I'm explaining here uh, will still work on the Samsung Galaxy S9 on its latest version. So the main goal here is to obtain code execution in EL3. And the prerequisites are to be part of the radio group, because this is the, uh, the least uh, privileged group that is able to communicate with the trust zone, and also to be able to write uh, files somewhere on the device. So our attack plan here uh, is to go from the normal world, try to find a vulnerability in a trusted, uh, in trusted application, exploit it, find a vulnerability in a second driver, exploit it again, and then uh, we're going to attack the, uh, the trusted OS and the monitor. So the software mitigation that you find uh, in, uh, in Trezon, or mostly the, the lack thereof, um, the, there is, so there is at least the X and bit, uh, but other than that, uh, you, you don't find a lot of uh, mitigation. So you have no, uh, you have no ISLR, you have no Py uh, executables, 
Um, it's possible to have uh, canary, uh, canaries implemented, but we haven't really seen them on the S6, S7, and S8, uh, and it's starting to be uh, used a lot more on the S9, but before that, not that much. So that means that if you have a vulnerability, uh, it's going to be pretty simple to exploit it. All right, so the first thing what we're going to do is to find vulnerability in a trusted application. Uh, so the vulnerability that we have found uh, is in the trusted that is called SEM. So we have no idea what this trusted does. The only thing that we know is that it has a common um, a buffer overflow in the fifth command handler. And this buffer overflow is uh, due to a mem copy uh, with a user control size, um, uh, a user control source, and it's going to copy it directly into the stack. So we have a textbook buffer overflow. Uh, now, we are, uh, if we exploit this with vulnerability, you know, we are able to execute code in SEL0. Uh, and now we are able to communicate with secure drivers. Uh, we are also able to make some syscalls, but the syscalls that are available to trusted applications are not that useful, and we haven't found anything interesting in them. So our next target will be uh, secure drivers. So the vulnerability that we have found uh, is, also, again, uh, a buffer overflow in the validator, validator secure driver. Uh, Again, we have no idea what this uh, driver does, but uh, there's a buffer overflow in the 15th uh, command handler, and it's uh, the same vulnerability as before. So we have a user control size, uh, user control source, and uh, copy it, it copies it directly into the stack. So now we have, uh, if we exploit this vulnerability, we have code execution in SCR0, but with higher privileges. And uh, now we're able to communicate uh, with RTM, uh, but also, we have access to more syscalls, and this is really interesting because the syscalls that we have access to are, uh, perform really sensitive operations. Uh, for example, we are able to map physical memory, uh, we are able to create threads, we are able to make SMCs, so really interesting stuff. Uh, right now, our next target will be the trusted OS and the monitor. So as I said, we are going to use a syscall to uh, exploit that, and the syscall we uh, are going to use is mmap. Uh, mmap is, can be used uh, to map the physical memory in secure and uh, non-secure states. And the vulnerability is that uh, there is no restriction on the, what you can map with uh, mmap. And so the monitor is going to be mapped at the address uh, 20, 22,000. Um, so we map it into our secure driver, we modify it uh, to hijack the SMC, and then we just um, execute the SMC from the secure driver. And uh, this vulnerability has been patched uh, in the newest version uh, of, the, of Samsung's trust zone, uh, I mean, in, uh, in Kinibi, uh, by using a blacklist. So now you cannot uh, just um, map anything you want. But uh, with this vulnerability on all the devices, what you can do is to have code execution in ER3. And uh, here's a quick example. Uh, I'm executing the exploit uh, right here. I'm looking at the value in current ER, so the current exception level, and it's going to, ret uh, to return the value C. Uh, but since current ER has, uh, has its value uh, shifted by two bits, what we do is that we shift it back on the right by two bits, and we obtain three, meaning that we have code execution in ER3, so we have uh, pretty much uh, compromised the entire system. So now, uh, these are the vulnerabilities. Now what can we do uh, fun with it? Well, the first thing we did is to uh, develop uh, a framework that would allow us to uh, exploit the vulnerabilities uh, easier, uh, more easily, and also to, um, to, 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 to create tools based on this frame, uh, framework. Uh, and I'm not go, uh, going to go um, into the details here, but the idea is that um, uh, you, yeah, actually I'm going to go into details. Um, <laughs> The, so right now we're going to use the, the EL3 vulnerability to have arbitrary access to Kinibi. So what it means is that uh, in EL3, we are going to uh, take the physical address of Kinibi, map it into uh, the page table, uh, for the MMU, uh, and um, now we can access Kinibi from the EL3. And uh, from there, we are able to add uh, a DR API function and a SVC to execute code in SEL1 natively. Uh, and uh, so at the end, with this framework, what we are able to do is to read and write uh, memory arbitrarily and also to execute code uh, in SEL1 and EL3 uh, pretty easily. All right, so the first demo I'm going to talk about is uh, finding the master key in the monitor. So uh, the master key is used uh, in cryptographic uh, operations. 
um, to find it, you have uh, you can reverse. Uh, what I did is that I reverse engineered the crypto driver that's called Dior Crypto. You can find this, uh, this secret driver uh, embedded uh, directly inside KNB. And um, when it's doing a uh, cryptographic operation, this driver will make a call to Dior API Zurich 1030. Uh, so you don't know the exact name, but um, this Dior API uh, can take four possible command ideas. Uh, so Zurich AA, AB, AC, and AD. Uh, the one that is interesting here, and the one that can uh, uh, give us the master key is Eric's AB. And um, this uh, DR API uh, will make a call will make a call to uh, SVC and this SVC is actually a wrapper around the SMC uh, Zerix B2 0005. And so uh, right now we have uh, two ways to uh, retrieve the master key. So we can either, either directly call uh, this DR, DR API Zurich 1030 uh, with the, uh, the correct power, uh, arguments or we can directly read the value in EL3. And I'm going to do both here. Uh, but first, let's take a look at the, uh, at the actual function. So um, what is interesting here, the, the only thing that is important uh, right here is that here you have the comparison uh, with the value AB, uh, meaning that you're going to go in this uh, basic block. And in this basic block, you have a SMC call uh, to the Xerix B2005 uh, SMC. And um, if we go to the handler of this SMC, you have uh, the, uh, so you just have to follow, follow along with the different arguments, etc. But the really important part here is that uh, in this uh, basic block, you have the value, um, you have Zurich 10 bytes that are going to be extracted from the, the address Zurich 10 1 E 4000. And this is where the master key is actually stored. And so what we can do uh, is to read it using our framework. So uh, here I'm just loading a vulnerable driver uh, to make the exploit work. And then I exploit uh, the actual vulnerability. And here uh, I'm going to retrieve the master key using the DOR API. So this is to make sure that uh, I'm actually retrieving the, the correct value uh, afterwards. So it's uh, uh, 98, 5F, etc. And if you read directly this value in EL3, so at the address Zurix 10 1 E 4000, uh, we can see right here that we have uh, retrieved the exact same value, uh, meaning that we can uh, have access to anything we want uh, in, the, in EL3. All right, so the second demonstration is going to be uh, to bypass uh, signature checks. Um, one of the, the interesting things that we wanted to do is to be able to load our own trusted applications, our own secret drivers, uh, because it's really useful when you want to execute uh, arbitrary code uh, in the secret world. But to do that, we needed to be able to, uh, to load this trusted because we didn't have uh, trustonic private keys, so we were not able to sign them uh, correctly. Uh, but since we have uh, all the capabilities uh, we want in the secret world, we can do anything we want, um, then you can just bypass these checks. So trusted applications and secret drivers are going to be loaded by um, RTM. And the signature is uh, verified using TLAPI signature verified. And there are only two calls to this function in RTM. Uh, these are the calls, it's not uh, really important. But the idea is that we're going to patch the, um, uh, the, the instructions that are checking the value returned by, uh, by this function. And uh, here I'm going to try to load, uh, so again, I'm doing the vulnerable driver. Uh, and then I'm trying to load uh, a fake trustlet. So a, fake, uh, a trustlet I've made uh, from scratch. And if I try to load it, it's going to set uh, error invalid operation, which is normal. But now I'm going to uh, exploit the vulnerability and bypass these checks. No. And now if I try to reload uh, this fake trustlet again, uh, now it's going to work and uh, we are able to load our own uh, uh, trust application in the secret world. And here you can see that we have uh, different logs that are printed, et cetera, uh, meaning that it works. All right, so the last demonstration I wanted to show you is uh, an instrumentation of the trusted OS. Um, so this is a really important result for us uh, to be able to do that, uh, because at this point, we have, we have no uh, debugging capabilities. Uh, everything that we have done it was done statically or using the emulator. But uh, by using our, trace, our, our, uh, our framework, we were, we were able to develop uh, a debugger, or at least uh, some kind of debugger, because uh, we cannot put actual breakpoints 
on uh, instructions, otherwise it's going to trigger the watchdog and the, and the phone will reboot. So what we do is that we instrument of, um, of a trusted OS by uh, replacing the instruction that we want to instrument by an undefined uh, instruction. And then we uh, hijack the, the exception, um, the in undefined instruction exception handler where we're going to write our own code. And uh, what's going to happen is that when the trusted uh, OS run, uh, executes our undefined instruction, it's going to trigger the undefined instruction exception and then run our own code. And uh, for the moment, this, uh, the, the code that we are running in, the, in this handler is to save the current context of the CPU. And then we, uh, we just execute the, the, uh, the, the instruction that we have replaced and the, the system just executes um, normally after that. So here are the results. Uh, I'm going to uh, connect to the phone. I'm uh, launching my debugger. And so the debugger is just uh, a simple, it's just a simple uh, Python uh, prompt. So the first thing I'm going to do is to add a breakpoint in MMAP. So this is arbitrary, I just taken uh, an SVC and I've put a breakpoint uh, inside it. And uh, if I disassemble uh, the, the instructions at this address, you can see that we have uh, the UDF uh, with uh, zero. Uh, so this is our undefined uh, instruction. Uh, the value afterwards, uh, you can put pretty much anything you want, but uh, personally, we're use, uh, I mean, I'm using it to, um, uh, to, to, to encode the number of the breakpoints. And uh, right now I'm going to make a call to this SVC, so from uh, the debugger. And uh, I don't know if you can, if you can see it, but uh, the, the argument of the debugger is going to be the number of the syscall, so this is seven for mmap. Then uh, you have the, um, the permissions of the, uh, the page you want uh, to, to map. Then you have uh, the starting address in the virtual address space, so the address space of the debugger, where you want to map your physical memory. Uh, the end virtual address, and finally your uh, physical uh, address that you want to map. And in that case, it's going to be uh, the first page uh, of the secure monitor. And so I've executed my, uh, my syscall. And now if I display the logs of the debugger, uh, so I've stripped, uh, I've stripped the, the, the rest of the results. Uh, there are more uh, calls to uh, the, the, SVC, the SVC that are made uh, between uh, the, the starting of the debugger and, uh, uh, and my, my own call to MMAP. But uh, here is uh, the result of my own call. And you can see that I have access to uh, the state of the CPU. And here you have R1, which is Zurich 100,000, so my start um, virtual address. In R2, I have uh, Zurich 100,000, uh, my end virtual address. In R3, I have my permissions. And in R4, I have the uh, physical address that I wanted to map. And so this is really uh, interesting to us because now we are able to debug the trusted OS and uh, it would be really useful to find other vulnerabilities um, in, uh, in, uh, in Samsung's trust zone. All right, so that's, uh, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much.